Nice. Have you thrown this on? Yeah. Let's clip it down there. So you will actually hear yourself in the speakers as you're going up the camera up there. Okay. But Do I need a. I'm introducing him. Um, no. We should, if, if he's standing near you, you should probably still pick it up. Okay. So, and, yeah. We can switch it out if you want. No. Yeah, if you want, you could, but yeah, it should probably I'll just stand right next to you. All right, yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stand awkwardly close to each other during the introduction. Uh, yeah. All right. So I'm officially being recorded now. Do you ever watch the recordings of you? I can't. It's too, it's too hard to watch. I tried to watch one once and I was just like, <sighs> it's like my, my voice sounds annoying and I was just flailing my hands everywhere like the whole talk, it was just horrifying. I try and make like a note to myself to keep my hands down now when I talk. Yeah. So. so I used to talk, I didn't move my hands at all. So now I try and <laughs> it looks <looks> really fake. <laughs> so somewhere between the two of us is like normal. Yeah. It's a little screen. Yeah, I don't know, the resolution's a little low, but whatever. I'm trying to get the. Well, I, I'm waiting for some comments on that last draft that I put up on Friday. Well, from anyone. Chris had commented like he had. Did he? Oh. I feel like I, all right. Hopefully, we're all. <laughs> I'm paranoid about that because I keep opening it up and like there's nothing in there. Well, and it generates another file as well. Oh, was he doing it in the Google? Uh, yeah. Okay, we gotta repost that because no, I haven't seen anything, so I haven't been doing anything with it. So I've just been working on my NSF grant, which I'm. I just keep seeing in um, my Gmail, Chris's ad comments, seasons. Oh, so they're definitely they're definitely working they're definitely working off a different document then, because I don't get any of that. And the one that I have. Maybe I get the notifications because it's my document. So maybe you need to make it your document. But but when I open it up, I don't it's see anything. That's because you're destroying every version you go into. <laughs> so there's nothing left. Yeah. Yeah, maybe everyone's hiding it from me to keep me from <laughs> keep me from blowing it up. All right, well we have to. I'll have to send me a link to the one that you're saying, and then I'll just merge. I'll try and merge the two together because they must have diverged at some point. I am delighted to introduce today Kelly Robbins. Kelly is an assistant professor here at Cornell in plant breeding and genetics, which is part of SIPS. He's an expert not just in plant quantitative genetics, but also animal quantitative genetics, uh, specializes in modeling and Bayesian statistics. Some of you who are visiting may know him as the module lead for the CGIR platform Excellence in Breeding. He leads the module on bioinformatics, biometrics, and data management. And not but not, last but not least, he uh, until last year was the director of the Gobi project, which you'll be hearing about more today. And uh, he built a great team here at Cornell and BTI, and I have the pleasure of leading that project now. So thanks very much, Kelly. Uh, he's going to be talking about technology-driven crop improvement, 
for Africa and South Asia. Thank you. All right, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so just to, I, I guess, give a, a little bit of background in, in terms of, of what I work on. Uh, so my lab is really focused on applying quantitative genetics, genomics, and computational science to improve the efficiency of crop breeding and increase understanding of complex traits. And what I'm going to be talking about today is a lot of the work that we're doing in that area, but, but very uh, focused and applied on uh, some of the collaborations we have with uh, crop breeding programs that operate in Africa and, and South Asia. Uh, so we're looking at models for utilization and optimized implementation of genomics and phenomics technologies and predictive breeding. And also, I, I'm not going to really talk about this today, but uh, the, the lab also has a lot of interest in utilizing genetically diverse material through rapid uh, cost-effective development of pre-breeding material. Um, and uh, a lot of that focuses on how we can use genomic information and genomic selection to do uh, rapid integration of, of diverse material. So I think Lucas yesterday brought up the, uh, the breeder's equation. I, I've got it here as well, just briefly. I might want to start taking bets on over under how many times this gets shown at the workshop this week. But I, you know, just to illustrate that um, you know, every, every crop is different. And there's uh, you know, a lot of specifics that you have to take into account when you're looking at how do you bring in you know, a new technology and integrate it, you know, into a breeding program to improve response to selection. But when we're talking about plant breeding, at a high level, you know, there's a lot of similarities from program to program. So you're going to, you're going to typically, you know, have some elite breeding material. You're going to identify some parents. You're going to make some crosses. Typically, there's a, there's a process of, of selecting out um, or selfing. If you're dealing with clonally propagated crops, uh, you can bypass a lot of this. And then eventually you're going to go into to some type of testing. You're going to look at a lot of varieties initially, uh, very few reps each. You're going to make some selections as you go along, and eventually you're going to uh, identify a new variety for release. And whenever we have uh, access to some new technologies, you know, whether it be genomics, whether it be high throughput phenotyping, remote sensing, it always helps to go back and think about well, what can we do differently with this technology? How could we utilize this to change the way in which we do breeding? And so, uh, you know, it, it really, no matter what we bring into a breeding program, it all comes back to, to response to selection. And we always have these same kind of levers that we can operate to try and maximize that. And so it's always helpful to think about how can we apply these uh, within the context of, of a breeding program. So today I'm going to be focused a lot on uh, uh, some of the work we're doing with the CGIR, and I think we have a lot of CGIR scientists here today. Um, it's the Consultative Group for International Agriculture Research. Their vision is a world free of poverty, hunger, and environmental degradation. And it's actually composed of, of multiple centers located throughout the world. Uh, right now, um, I'm doing a lot of work with CIMIT, uh, with ICRASAT, and with ERI. But with Excellence in Breeding Module 5, which I'll talk about a little bit today, uh, we're really working across all of these. And so I mentioned uh, this briefly in some of the, the earlier slides, but you know, technology is evolving quite rapidly. So what we can do in terms of genomics, what we can do in terms of phenomics is, is changing on a daily basis, both in the scale of which we can collect data and also the cost in which we can collect a lot of this data. But being able to actually take this and turn it into useful information is a bit of a challenge, right? So we, we need to think about what types of advanced modeling do we need to be putting in place to be able to deal with this type of data, to be able to make it useful for breeding decisions. We need to have good breeding IT infrastructure in place. Um, long gone are the days in which you could run a breeding program, uh, a modern breeding program effectively on a, on a laptop with some Excel files. Once you start collecting some of this information, there's just no way that you can handle it uh, using files. Uh, and we also have to rethink the way breeding is done. I think one of the mistakes we often make is, is, is we take a new technology and we just figure out a way to kind of tack it on to the way we, we've always done breeding rather than really think about how we can change the way we do breeding. So this is a, a, a bit of a, I, I think, a lead in to the, to the Excellence in Breeding project. Uh, but one of the things I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about was, uh, you know, when we think about a, a new technology coming online, right? So there's, there's a lot of initial work that's done 
which I would consider a little more basic research, which is just sort of, you know, how do we get this to work properly? How do we uh, take some new advancement in basic science and turn it into a useful tool? Um, so this would be basic translational research here. Then there, there comes a phase where we do a proof of concept where we say, can this actually work in a breeding program? Can we actually use this to increase our response to selection? That's followed by a scaling step where we say, okay, well, in this, this very small instance, we've, we've validated that this can actually work. Now we need to scale this up and do it on a much larger scale. And then, and then you move into routine implementation. And so this is a, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that really goes into each of these, these steps. And, and I, I bring up, you know, just having worked a little bit in industry and having worked in, in academia as well, I can say that the academia and, and the public sector in general tends to be very good in this area, uh, not so great here. And you know, from working in industry, industry typically doesn't um, involve itself in this type of research, but they're very good in terms of scaling and, and routine implementation. So being able to take a concept that has been validated and turn it into routine practice, industry does that quite well. And so, you know, in working with the CGIR, you know, there's, there's a question of, well, where does the CGIR fit in this model, right? And, I, you know, it's, it's not necessarily an easy question to ask, you know, answer. You can think of the CGIR as doing a lot of translational research that enables national and private companies working in Africa and South Asia to be able to be more effective breeders. Or you can think of the CGIR as a system that's developing germplasm, so really running breeding programs and the ultimate end product that they're delivering is new and improved germplasm. The way the CGIR is currently funded is, you know, typically it's, it's project-based at the PI level. You have five-year funding cycles. And I, this really is geared a little bit more towards translational research than what I would consider running a really efficient breeding pipeline. Um, and so, you know, there has been some discussion at the funding level um, really about if you want the CGIR to be a system that's developing germplasm, we may have to rethink about how we fund you know, some of these programs because the way we're doing it right now, it doesn't really incentivize the type of uh, behavior that you would want in terms of a, uh, running a breeding program that delivers germplasm. So I wanna talk about a specific use case um, around you know, what we're doing in excellence in breeding and what's being done in, in, in Gobi as well in collaboration with the CGIR, and that's the idea of predictive breeding. Right? So at the end of the day, we want to infer the genetic merit of some new line as early, as cost-effectively, and as accurately as possible. And there's really, I would say, two elements to this. One is the breeding strategy. The breeding strategy is what tells us what we want to predict and how we want to use the predictions in our breeding program, right? So that's going to define how this technology and how these predictions are going to change the way in which we do breeding. And then we have the prediction strategy, what data, what technologies, and what methodologies we're going to use to make these predictions, right? And then, you know, in, in terms of going from a strategy to actual routine implementation, there's a lot of infrastructure that has to be put into place when we're talking about some of these really high throughput new technologies. Well, you know, we have to have high quality, cost effective, high throughput data. Um, there's no way that we can deal with this without data management. You need to have good data analytics to be able to take this vast amount of, of data and turn it into information and then decision support. How do we actually deliver this to breeders to, to be able to make the decisions? And all of this needs to be in alignment with some breeding strategy. And, you know, so one of the common mistakes that's often made is that you know, you'll have some group working on some POC, and there's really not a lot of engagement around the breeding strategy, and if you do that, what happens is you have this great idea, and then you just try and tack it on to an existing breeding strategy that maybe is not optimal for that. Vice versa, if you spend a lot of time thinking about breeding strategy, um, and then you move into implementation stage, and you haven't, you know, spent the time building up some of this infrastructure, what you're gonna find is everything's just gonna fall flat on its face the first time you actually try and run it on a large scale. So in the CGIR, you know, the problem that, that we've been trying to address with projects like Gobi, projects like NextGen Cassava, projects like Excellence of Breeding is the fact that, that we've seen very low rates of genetic gain in many of the programs that are targeting Africa and, and South Asia. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, 
Um, and, and some of it really comes around, you know, what type of support and how these, these programs are being funded and what types of information they have available to them. There's also a very high weighted average area of age of, of varieties. So, so what this means is that if you go out into the, to the farmer's fields in these regions of the world, what you find is they're still planting varieties that are sometimes 30, 40 years old. Um, there's a lot of challenges that these breeding programs have to deal with. So, you know, within the CGIR, you're breeding for a large number of crops in diverse environments. Um, that in and of itself makes it challenging to, to really build the types of infrastructure you need to support all of these crops with different objectives. Uh, there is limited resources for large-scale multi-environmental testing. Um, so you, you look at the way these breeding programs operate, there's a, there's a point at which they pass off their germplasm to national programs and where a lot of that multi-environmental testing is done. But that information doesn't always feed back into the CGIR breeding programs. Um, the funding model is good for proof of concepts, but not for scaling and routine implementation. I think there was a, a question yesterday about the database. Well, we, we're a little nervous about adopting this database because it's on a five-year funding model. What's going to happen when that you know, funding runs out? Um, you know, that's part of, part of the problem is that you, know, you need to have that good, consistent baseline investment in infrastructure to be able to do it. And also just you know, in some of these areas, you know, just getting to some of these sites can be difficult. It's not always easy to get good harvest data. We do have new technologies that are coming online that I think we all recognize are going to be very important um, to breeding, and I think they can be very impactful to a lot of what's being done in this, this region. So we have next-gen sequencing, we have remote proximal sensing, things like blockchain. You know, they have the potential to improve response to selection, to improve the way that we can do testing and the efficiency of our testing, and also uh, increase our understanding of, of the supply chain and, and, you know, where exactly things are going wrong in terms of getting these new improved varieties into the farmer's hands. So what, what seems to happen a lot, I think, in, in public sector programs is that we end up kind of getting stuck in this proof of concept phase where we, we sort of run experiment after experiment. Uh, we have a good idea that it's working, but we never quite move into that. Now we're doing this on a routine level. And, uh, you know, I think that part of the problem are in, the, in the CGIR and, and with some of these national programs is that, you know, if you look at a given crop, there's a lot of investment and a lot of effort going into it, but really what we have are, you know, kind of a loose confederation of small to medium-sized breeding programs that are largely operating fairly independently with, with independent budgets. That makes it hard to invest in a lot of the, the, the real core infrastructure you would need to be able to utilize this data. Um, prediction strategies and breeding strategies aren't always very well aligned. I, I see that a lot where you're, you're doing a lot of work on a POC, but the, you know, the breeding leads or the, the breeders aren't necessarily engaged in that. And so there's, there's this disconnect between the vision of the breeding program and the vision of uh, you know, people like me that are trying to drive some POC. Um, there's also, I, I think, oftentimes a lack of, of metrics and stage gates for go, no-go decisions. So at what point is, is something in a POC ready to invest in, in large-scale implementation? And, and if you don't have those clear metrics, then you end up in a, in a situation of, okay, well, I can predict, uh, you know, a, a phenotype with 0.4 accuracy. Is that good enough? for implementation or not, how would I implement that? And I, I think this drives a, a little bit of, you know, the, there tends to be a lack of a strong push or pull to, to move from a POC to full-scale implementation. So if you're a PI on a project and you're getting funding and you're getting publications, there's maybe not enough of incentive to, to really try and push that into routine implementation. And then on the breeding side, you know, if you're not really engaged with what's going on in these proof of concepts, uh, you're not going to get a lot of pull from them. So these are all being recognized, I think, by the, the funders. And so there's a recent funders initiative that's sort of been launched, which is to say, well, let's take a step back. And you know, if we really want to drive uh, higher rates of genetic gain and we want to make sure that these improved lines are getting into farmers' fields, maybe we need to think a little bit about how we invest and we fund breeding programs. And that was really the driver behind a new initiative, and it's called the, the Excellence in Breeding Platform, that I'll talk about a little bit today, right? So 
you know, the basic gist of, of the excellence in breeding is that uh, it, it's, it's really a, an investment in modernizing breeding programs targeting, uh, you know, greater food security um, in Africa and South Asia. And so uh, the idea here is that well, any one of these individual breeding programs doesn't have the type of uh, resources to be able to build up the infrastructure to be able to scale out genotyping to be able to scale out phenotyping the way they need to do it so we're going to try and bring all of this investment together under one one project and, and invest in building this infrastructure that we can then push out across all of these uh, smaller breeding pro breeding programs um, so the EIB will draw from innovations in the public and private sector provide access to cutting-edge tools services uh, and best practices. Um, there, there's some pretty, I guess, ambitious targets for metrics of success, but you know, we're looking at uh, gains of at least 1.5% annually in farmers' fields. You know, that includes just making improvements in the breeding programs, but it also implies that it's actually making it to the farmers, which has been a bit of a challenge. Um, and we want to uh, decrease the average age of varieties in farmer fields to less than 10 years. In many cases, it's, it's far older than that. Um, we're working with both public and private sector breeding programs, targeting farmers in, in low and middle income um, countries. And so uh, this initial phase of excellence in breeding is predominantly CGIR focused. There are four NARS partners that, that, that we're bringing in as part of this initial effort. But the hope is that what we develop can be pushed out um, uh, to, to anyone who, who can use it in this area. So to do this, we're going to be trying to deliver on multiple things. You know, so we want to have well-characterized product profiles for each variety replacement. And so the idea is, you know, if, if you want to breed for better varieties, you need to have a very clear idea of what that variety is supposed to be. And so. Uh, it can be very difficult in a lot of these regions to understand that because you don't get necessarily a lot of feedback in terms of you know what works and what doesn't work in a lot of these very diverse environments and so uh, you know part of what we're doing is is, is going to be to sit down with these breeding programs and try and go through let's let's have some very targeted profiles of what we're breeding towards a stage gauge uh, stage gate process from breeding cross to farm this goes back to having very clear metrics and making sure all the right people are involved in all of this, the decisions in terms of what you're, you're, you're starting with all the way through to the, to the varietal release to make sure that you're not going off the rails anywhere. Um, optimized breeding schemes, this goes back to you know, breeding strategies and how to incorporate some of these new technologies. Let's really take a step back and think uh, about how we're doing breeding and how we can best incorporate these. Uh, routine assessments of genetic gain. Uh, Lower cost, better targeted genotyping data. So there's an idea that you know, if we can pull um, demand across multiple breeding programs, that we can demand better prices from vendors and get more low cost in terms of, of genotyping. Lower cost, uh, uh, also working in, in the phenotyping area as well. And then uh, what the, the module that I'm pr uh, primarily working on, which is biometrics and bioinformatics tools that support automation, data integration, and decision making. So this just uh, kind of goes through that a little bit, but organizes it into the, what are basically the five modules of excellence in breeding. So we have breeding program excellence. Uh, this is being led by George Koch. Um, and, and this is really about putting into place, you know, at the breeding leadership level, uh, best practices and mechanisms to define what the proper breeding targets are to put into place appropriate stage gates to make sure that from breeding cross up until the release of a variety into the field that you have the right people involved in the decisions, you're using the right information to make those advancements. Breeding scheme optimization, we're still looking for a lead for this position. We're actively uh, searching, but this will be someone that works with the breeding programs, goes in, uh, evaluates on the ground how the breeding program is being run and, and you know, uh, looks to, to provide advice and feedback in, in terms of what are some things that you can do to improve the efficiency of the breeding program itself. Genotyping and sequencing services. Uh, this is looking at pulling demand, negotiating with vendors, and also putting into place some of the, the, the data management capabilities to be able to you know, effectively sample and genotype your material. Uh, phenotyping. This is uh, working both at 
you know, what are some things we can do um, just at, you know, the basic kind of harvest traits that we deal with? Are there things that we can do? Are there investments that we can make in equipment to improve our ability to get good harvest data? Also looking at things like how do we bring in remote sensing? How do we bring in uh, proximal sensing to be able to uh, do more and better phenotyping? And then the bioinformatics, biometrics, and data management model. So under bioinformatics, biometrics, and data management, uh, it's a bit of a, as of now, an umbrella organization. And so uh, there are a lot of projects that sort of fit within there. There's the integrated breeding platform. There's Gobi. Um, there's some uh, initiatives under transform rice breeding. Um, and from here on out, I, I just want to talk about, in the context of Module 5, uh, what's being done with the Genomic Open Source Breeding Informatics Initiative, which you'll hear about a, a little bit more later today. And, you know, so the mission statement is to enable the implementation of genomic and marker-assisted selection as part of routine breeding programs in developing countries. And we always highlight that that routine part's pretty important because I think that uh, a lot of times people underestimate how much work really goes into we have, a, we have a functioning proof of concept to now we have routine implementation. It's actually quite challenging and uh, a, a, a lot of work. Um, you have to bring a lot of people together working in different skill sets to make it come together. Um, and so as part of this building a scalable genomics data management system, we're looking at uh, you know, how to condense large volumes of data into simple selection decisions and integrate data across systems. So just, uh, you know, kind of going back to this, uh, you know, initial slide of looking at, well, new technology development, POC scaling, routine implementation. So on the new technology side, um, you know, what, what is rapidly changing is uh, the genotyping platforms, right? And so it's becoming increasingly cost effective, high throughput, and fast turnaround. We're at a point now where we're under, I think, under $10 to be able to generate the type of information we need to do genomic predictions. I think we're rapidly moving towards $5. And at that price point, it really changes the way you would think about how you use genomic information in a breeding program. Given we have this new technology, being able to do the, the proof of concept and the scaling really, you know, we, we have to have a good breeding strategy in place. We need to have good training data to, to tune our prediction models on. And we need to do some test implementations just to make sure that we are getting the accuracies that we think we are. And then finally, for routine implementation, we need data management systems. We need robust analysis pipelines. Typically, by the time you get your genomic information, you have very little time to actually turn around those predictions um, to the breeders. And well-documented SOPs would be standard operating procedures. That's honestly, this is probably the most important part of routine implementation is that everyone has a very clear understanding of, of how, to, how they need to be operating. So just to take a step back and, and talk about the technology piece. Um, so uh, you know something that the Ed Buckler's lab has been working a lot on, and it probably will get discussed uh, later on this week, is is this idea of the the, the PhD pipeline or the practical haplotype the pipeline. And the way this works is, in essence, we we create a a relatively simplified pan genome. Um, uh, from multiple varieties in a, in a breeding program. Um, once this is created, um, we can then use uh, either uh, short reads um, generated from uh, really low depth skim sequencing. There are some other options like ramp seq that you can do. Um, and you can do this very cost effectively. And by having uh, you know, this, this pan genome created, you have the ability to be able to train models that can uh, impute into higher density information. So the idea is that we'll have a certain subset of lines that we resequence at a very high depth, we invest some money in. Uh, when we look at actual lines that we're making selection decisions on, we can do that with very low depth uh, information um, very cheaply, and we can impute back to the high depth information that we might want for doing various things like GWAS and, and genomic selection. And in doing so, in implementing this type of strategy, we should be able to get down to relatively uh, cheap cost per line in terms of genotyping. So uh, Ramu uh, sent me this slide, I think, last week, and this is looking at uh, a new methodology that's being developed. Um, 
and it's called RampSeq. And, and basically, this, this, this uses a, a, you know, a, a, a temperature-activated primer that, that sort of cleaves here to sort of activate the, the PCR reaction. Um, it's, it's quite sensitive to binding around this uh, RNA base, which makes it much more specific, so you can do a lot more uh, multiplexing. And the long and short of it is, is that using this type of, uh, of, of chemistry, you can potentially uh, multiplex up to, to 2,000 PCR reactions in a, in a, single, uh, <clears throat> in a single run. We can do very high multiplexing, there's fast turnaround, and we get very consistent, you know. So unlike skim sequencing, where you get sort of this random sampling throughout the genome uh, of various read depths, here we're going to get uh, a subset of the genome uh, at pretty high depth. Um, and right now they're estimating that the cost of this is about $5, excluding overhead. And so we're really talking about getting into uh, very cheap genotyping for implementation of genomic selection. From this, we can get about 2,000 markers, right? So the next step is thinking about strategy. So if we can genotype for somewhere between five and ten dollars, how would that change our, our breeding strategy? So this is just going back to that kind of generic representation we had before. We're going to have some line development phase here. Um, and then we're going to start with testing. We're probably going to start with a lot of varieties at very few locations, and we'll select. Eventually, we'll get down to a very small number of varieties that we're, we're testing at, at a lot of environments. And so we think about, well, if we can use, if we can get genomic information quite cheaply, and we can get reasonable prediction accuracies, what are we actually, what are we going to do with that? Well, you know, we can do rapid recycling. You know, so we think about, you know, at some point we're going we're gonna to use genomic information and whatever phenotypic information we have available and we're going to make some decisions about what lines are going to be the parents of our next cross. And we can really do that at any point after we make the initial breeding cross. Obviously, the earlier we do this, the more we reduce our generation interval, probably the less accuracy that we have to be able to do it. And so those are trade-offs that we have to consider. We can use the information to change how we advance lines through the system itself, right? So we could probably start selecting at an earlier stage about which lines do we want to move forward towards where we get into the really expensive part of our testing program, which is actually planting it out in fields uh, um, in multiple uh, environments and countries. We can also think about, well, how would we use these predictions to change the way in which we actually do our screening, right? And so one option might be, well, if we can get some relatively accurate predictions, maybe we don't need this first stage of testing anymore. Maybe we can just skip straight to a later stage of testing um, and move our varieties out of our pipeline a year earlier, which gives us um, pretty significant genetic gains, right? And so one of the things that I think the Gobi Project's doing pretty well is that we're uh, engaging with breeders to understand the current breeding processes, constraints, and parameters, right? And so the first thing, you know, if you want to work with a program to try and figure out, well, what is the best approach, first thing you really need to understand their breeding program. And so we've been uh, investing time uh, working with Icrasat, Sim, and Erie to, to, to really try and understand how they're doing breeding and, and how they really want to be doing breeding. We need to develop potential approaches to implement predictive breeding. Um, we want to be able to estimate you know, critical parameters using pilot projects, so we want to understand what are the various parameters within this breeding program that we can operate with. And then finally, um, uh, the plan is to utilize simulations to narrow in on a few promising approaches that we can start to drive towards a more routine implementation. So I'm, I'm just going to, you know, present a, a couple of examples here real quick. So one, uh, you know, one of the, the programs that we've been working close with, closely with is the Simit Maze breeding program. And uh, so they actually did a pretty large scale implementation of genomic selection in their East Africa breeding program this past year. Um, they didn't have a large amount of historical data uh, simply because they've been moving through marker platforms and we weren't able to combine those platforms to get a real deep uh, multi-year training set. And so, uh, you know, the initial strategy was, well, we're going we're gonna to do within population selection. So we'll plant half of a population out in year one. We'll phenotype it. We'll train a model. And then we'll predict the other half. And that other half that we didn't test, whatever was really good, we'll just skip a stage and we'll move it on to a later stage of testing. I, you know, it's, it's a pretty straightforward implementation as far as implementations go, 
but I think everyone understands that it's not an optimal implementation of, of genomic selection, right? And so here's just you know a few examples, uh, you know, of, of what we've seen, right? And so there are some populations where, you know, good I, I guess is a relative term, but in terms of predicting yield, uh, there are some populations that, that we're getting pretty reasonable prediction accuracies where we feel like we can actually make some decisions from. And then there are some populations where we don't seem to have any predictive power whatsoever. Um, and so, there, you know, one of the things we're working with is, is this idea of, well, you know, can we develop certain customized training sets, right? And so given I want to predict this specific line from across, what is the optimal training set that I can use to maximize pr pr um, prediction? You know, from that we can take into account, well, how related is it to other lines? We can also look at, well, what are the target environments versus the environments that we have in our, our training prediction set? And, and so, you know, if, if we look at these populations, you know, instead of predi predicting within a population, can we gain accuracy by, let's say, combining populations that are more genetically related to each other? Um, perhaps, perhaps we need to be just putting all of this data together to do one large prediction. Um, and then also there's the question of which population should we actually be predicting at all? And can we um, a priori infer what populations we think we're going to have good accuracy to predict and what populations we aren't? The ultimate goal here is to try and bypass stage one testing. So if you look back to that, uh, you know, options of strategy. Uh, Simmon, I think, early on is going with a fairly conservative strategy, which is we want to skip that first stage of testing. And, and in doing so, we can recoup some cost. We can also recycle lines a year earlier, which gives us, uh, you know, minus one on that generation interval in the denominator of the response to selection. We've also been working with, with ICRSAT quite a bit. And so ICRSAT, we've been working with their chickpea breeding program. And so one of the things we've been looking at is uh, they, they have uh, basically an irrigated environments, which, uh, you know, have enough water and they have rain fed. Uh, kind of dry season environments where you have a, a lot of drought stress. And whenever you're dealing with a varietal crop, there's always that initial stage where you're doing seed increases. You don't really have necessarily enough seed to go into a lot of multi-environmental testing. So you're fairly constrained in what you can test on. And so the question is, in this early stage where we're not going to be able to do multi-environmental testing, how well can we use genomic information to predict into to other environments, right? And so here's just a, 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 an example of, of what can be done if you can ha measure correlated traits to help augment your prediction, right? And so in this case, we're looking at predicting seed yield. And so if we only use historical seed yield data to predict seed yield, we're getting an accuracy a little bit above 0.5, which is actually pretty good. We have two correlated traits, seed weight and biomass. Uh, seed weight has a correlation of 0.24, biomass has a correlation of 0.8. Uh, you can see if we include a moderately correlated trait in this prediction, we get a bit of a bump. And that is to say that, and this is a, a purely a, a, a scenario that you want to implement, but just to I illustrate the concept here. If I were to have historical information on both seed weight and seed yield, and then I were to say, for instance, have an actual phenotypic measure on a line, uh, for seed weight and predicted seed yield using historical information and that phenotypic information, you get a big bump. If you include a highly correlated trait, you can see you get a really huge bump in your prediction accuracy. And so to bring this back to an actual scenario, what we have is we have rain-fed and irrigated environments. And so the question is, if we have historical information on rain-fed and ir irrigated, and we can plant out in an early stage, let's say, in an irrigated field, how well can we predict performance in rain-fed or drought conditions, right? And so, you know, to, to do an initial look at this, we've, we basically just looked at, well, how correlated are these, uh, are the genetic uh, performance in these various environments are. And so, like, if you trained only on rain-fed data and tried to predict irrigated, or you trained only on irrigated and tried to predict rain-fed, for some of these complex traits, you're getting a correlation you know, uh, around 0.5, right, which is somewhere in between these two. And so if we wanted to do some sparse testing initially in a program, we could say, well, we could use historical data on irrigated and rain-fed. We could test these lines initially in rain-fed, and by including the rain-fed, uh, or test them initially in irrigated, and by including the irrigated data, we could potentially get some pretty significant bumps in our ability to predict into 
uh, rain fed or drought environment. So right now we're working with ICRASAT to look at the use of correlated traits and sparse testing strategies for bringing this information into their breeding program. All right, so you know, kind of going along with the, the, the proof of concept and scaling, uh, project management and development of the standard operating procedures, I think, you know, as I mentioned before, is probably one of the most critical parts of being able to actually execute this. So, so everything works fine on a small scale. In theory, everything's great. And then you try and implement this on a, log, a large scale and everything goes wrong, right? So one of the things that gobi has been doing is we've been really working closely with the programs to help coordinate the initial efforts. So one of the nice resources the Gobi project has is we've brought in several people from industry that have actually done some of these implementations before in the private sector. And so they sort of understand the complexities and how to manage some of these projects to try and scale them up. You know, in the process of doing this, we take notes of bottlenecks in the process and we feed that information back in terms of refining how we do this moving forward. And specifically from the Excellence in Breeding Module 5 standpoint, we try and take this information back to what we're building in terms of the IT infrastructure to make sure that we're uh, supporting these types of efforts. And just to kind of, I guess, illustrate some of the complexity, this is just for sample or geno genotyping, right? Um, so you're going to sample some plant in the field you're going to ship that sample somewhere. There's going to be some vendor, um, the CGIR mostly outsources all of its genotyping, that's going to then take this information. You're going to generate some genotype data that's going to come back in the system, and then ultimately that has to be matched up with phenotypic information in the field. And what you find is that, you know, there's a lot of data passing through a lot of different systems. And if you don't have a, a very good, robust IT management, data management system in place, what happens is that when the data comes out the other end, it can sometimes be very difficult to match back up with the phenotypic data, right? And so one of the biggest challenges in doing genomic selection is just figuring out how to get the genotype data and the phenotype data to, to match up. And it's, it's a lot harder than you might think. You could think of a lot of examples of where that goes wrong, but um, this is actually, even from a data management standpoint, you know, a, a somewhat complex operation because ultimately we're dealing with multiple different systems that are being developed by multiple different projects. And so if we look at just this use case of sample tracking, we have uh, BMS, we have cassava base, we have B4R, breeding for results, and we have the, the Gobi data management system. We also have Simit sample, sample tracker system as well. So all of these systems, and then we have the limb systems of whatever external vendor is being used to do the genotyping. And so we have to make sure that all of these systems are communicating together, that as we pass information through the system, we're not losing anything. Um, and so to, to be able to fully predict breeding, uh, you know, predictive breeding, multiple systems ha need to be able to communicate and exchange information. So the Excellence in Breeding has been working to define a common architecture as well as data standards. Lucas talked a lot about data standards yesterday, right? Those are critical to enable successful development and deployment of an open source breeding system. And a lot of that strategy hinges around BROPI, which uh, again, Lucas mentioned yesterday, but this is an open source API. And the idea is that we can try and get these systems to adhere to the BROPI standards and that will make the communication between systems a lot easier moving forward, right? And so this is, uh, I guess, kind of a high level uh, architecture. This was developed by Tom Hagen um, at CIMIT, who's, who's part of uh, the Excellence in Breeding. And uh, the USDA recently launched a project called the Breeding Insights Project, which may get discussed a little later this week, I don't know, but they're also adopting the same kind of high-level architecture here, right? But this basically just sort of breaks operations down into to key domains. And, and the challenge that we have specifically with Excellence in Breeding and working in the CGIR is that we have multiple databases that are all operating in different areas here. We, we do have some gaps, like for instance here, um, but being able to get all of these to work together in the way they have to work together is, is gonna be one of the big challenges that we have to work on within Excellence in Breeding. So just to focus in a little bit on the, on the genomics piece, I think because that leads in a little bit to what's gonna be discussed later today. Um, you know, when we talk about genotype data, and especially cheap genotype data. So if we really want to get down to the sub $10, uh, the trade-off there is that, that we're, we're moving into 
to NGS type of data, we're moving into skim sequencing, we're moving into uh, a lot of imputation. If we're dealing with clonal crops, it can be even particularly difficult because we have to do a lot of phasing. The long and short of it is, is to get, right now to get cheap genotyping data, we have to deal with difficult data and uh, uh, sequence data. And so part of what Gobi's trying to do is, is build a robust uh, system to be able to handle this type of data, to do the types of bioinformatics you need to do, and also uh, to be able to do some of the analyses you need to do to be able to get this back. And so this system uh, is, is based off of, uh, we have some, some native client applications for loading and extracting data. We also are collaborating with other projects to enable them to pull data directly from the system. We have web services APIs. Some of this is Gobi specific. We're working to make this Broppy compliant. Uh, we have a middle layer, and then the actual data is, is, is basically a hybrid system where metadata is being stored in a Postgres database, and the actual uh, genotype calls are being stored in HDF5 files. We did a lot of benchmarking across sol solutions, and, and HDF5 um, really was by far the fastest in terms of being able to query large volumes of data, and so that's what we burned in on to, to improve uh, how, how quickly we can return information from this system. Uh, not to get too much into the plant breeding API since it was brought up yesterday, but this really is a, a critical effort for us. Um, it's about creating a, you know, an efficient digital ecosystem, so we need to have all of these systems talking to each other to be able to support uh, breeding in, in a lot of these programs we're working with. Um, I, I will say that, that Broppy is a standard based on other standards, and so uh, in, in terms of uh, a lot of the data standards that we're trying to implement um, within these databases, Broppy is, is a way in which to enforce that, right? Because if we define our API calls with these standards in mind, then that means that if the system's going to be compliant with Broppy, they have to map their system to those same data standards. And so, uh, the, the hope is that we can use Broppy to ensure that all of the systems that we have operating in this larger ecosystem are adhering to the types of data standards that we need. One example of that is, is recently we've been working across systems to implement universally unique IDs for samples, which is really critical to be able to do that tracking. Um, otherwise, we have different systems that are generating different IDs that can overlap and um, aren't necessarily going to align with each other. So I guess just to conclude, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential in, in applying new technologies. Um, there's several projects right now, Gobi, Excellence in Breeding, Next Gen Cassava, that are working with the CGIR and national breeding programs to rethink how breeding is done for staple food crops in Africa and South and Asia. Initiatives like BRAPI have built a large community of, of developers and data scientists that are working together to build open source software. And I would say, you know, applying community standards to, to data analytics software and development can significantly increase the utility of the software and enable rapid development and deployment into public sector breeding programs. So I guess my, uh, you know, my, I, I guess request to everyone that's working in this area is to please think about, you know, if, if you are developing software, you are developing capabilities uh, that are going to really enable uh, use of some of these new technologies in a breeding program, really think about how you can interact with the larger community to make that software much more useful to everybody else. If you build something that's very specific to what you're doing, we're not going to be able to leverage that in, in something like uh, Excellence in Breeding Module 5, but if you adhere to Broppy standards, uh, suddenly that becomes much more useful to us and, and potentially much more impactful in terms of how we deliver that. So with that, I'll just uh, close and thank the, the, the many people that have been involved in these projects. And I'm take, happy to take any questions. Yes. No, no, I, I, I was saying that uh, if I'm dealing with a varietal crop or a hybrid crop, there's a step where I, I have to drive it to being homozygous before I would, I would test it in the field. You still have to do all the testing, yeah. And the second one uh, relates to the graphic shot from seeds, mm -hmm. regarding the sample generations, I think it's ideal for this The 
Yeah, so I mean, it's a it's an optimization problem, right? So you know, the your prediction accuracy for like a complex trait is going to be a function of uh, really how many independent chromosomal segments you have segregating, which is a, a function of uh, effective population size and the number of phenotypic records you have, right? And so, you know, in theory, you would optimize your prediction accuracy by maximizing your number of phenotypic records while not increasing your effective population size substantially, right? And so you have to account for that trade-off. And so, you know, when thinking about what are you going to put into that training set, you have to look at both of those criteria. How closely related are they to the prediction set? How many records are you grabbing? And how much, you know, additional phenotypic information do you grab by being able to include that? And on a whole, is it going to actually improve the accuracy or, or decrease the accuracy of the predictions? And so, that's really what we're looking at is how do we balance those, those factors to be able to develop some algorithms that would sort of automatically say this is, this is the optimal prediction set for this particular line or this particular population. Um, Liz is probably better to answer that. Right now, we, we can handle polyploids that behave like diploids in terms of marker segregation. Um, you know, we, we, we've had some conversations uh, uh, with SIP, who I think is developing some tools to try and be able to handle, uh, you know, markers and, and polyploid to be able to call and analyze markers and, and polyploid crops. And um, I, I, I think we're looking to try and collaborate with them to, to bring some of those tools in. But right now, there's, there's not support for that. But certainly in the future, we're looking at it. We'll talk about that in our next talk. <laughs> we'll yes. Ruma? Mm -hmm. So this for breeding programs like uh, Nixon, Kasawa, uh, uh, supporting the Bogi, uh, EAB, come up with different products to be the high category of the category of the problem. So how efficient the PGR systems have, the P systems, or the extensions of this could transfer the better field from the pharmacy, uh, so here is flat to the pharmacy. Yeah, you know, I, I think that that probably varies from country to country. It probably varies from crop to crop. You know, the CGIR is in a particularly challenging position in, in the sense that they, they have ownership for developing some of these varieties, but they, they don't distribute any of it. So that's, that falls on the national partners. That falls on any sort of local breeding companies. And so the CGIR would develop new material. They would say, hey, here's the material various national programs and, and industry could pick that up and distribute it. But, you know, I, 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 th I guess, uh, you know, there is a bit of a question of, you know, in terms of why these improved varieties aren't actually being adopted by farmers. You know, is it that, you know, the, the actual supply chain itself is, is just broken and so things just don't make it through the system and the farmers never really see these improved varieties? Is it that the improved varieties aren't improved enough? for the farmers to, to really say, well, yeah, we actually want to adopt this over this proven thing that we know works. Um, or is it that, you know, what we're breeding is not, is not the right profile for what the farmers want? Like, you know, in other words, maybe we're making a lot of gain, but we're not, we're not making gain in the traits that the farmers are really interested in. And so it's probably a mix of those three things. But, uh, you know, it, it, it is challenging to make sure that things make it to the farmer. Um, and that's why we're bringing in some of the national partners early on with excellence in breeding, because it's ultimately the national partners would, would play the, the lead role in making sure whatever comes out of the CGIR actually makes it to the farmers.
Well, so, so that's largely following, following in, in module one. And, and so the plan is to, um, uh, to really sit down with, with the breeding leads and, and some of the key players um, in these various breeding programs and work with them to, to map out a strategy. Um, once that strategy is in place, then the idea is that these other modules would align to that and try and deliver capabilities to help them uh, to meet that strategy. And so George is right now going to a lot of different CG centers and meeting with, with people face to face. We need to get the module two lead position hired. That's pretty critical for us because um, uh, that, that person will play, a, I think, a big role in helping define what that, that breeding strategy is as well. So um, the longer that position remains unfilled, filled, uh, the more challenge we'll have. We are going to, I think, look at setting up some, some plant breeding academy uh, workshops next year. Um, we may have a few of those throughout the year to really bring in some leaders from all these breeding programs and, and sort of work very closely with them to, to try and map out. And we're also trying to engage uh, the private sector, you know, Monsanto, Corteva, to, to you know, be able to provide some, some insights um, in, in terms of how to effectively move things into routine um, routine applications within these breeding programs. And you mentioned the, the main problem with that is the funding and the, the short cyclical funding uh, from multiple bodies. Do you see that changing, the funding bodies becoming more aligned to a long-term goal? I, 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 th I think that will happen, yes. Um, so I think that uh, there's, there's a good chance that that at least the, the larger donors will, will, will move more to a system where they're, they're funding a, for lack of a better word, product profile, mm -hmm. right? So, so they would support a breeding program as a whole and achieving some specific variety profile that they're trying to use to, to basically replace a variety, right? So, so, I mean, part of it is, is they want to see that that you've identified the variety that you want to replace, right? So what is this 40-year-old variety that, that everyone is still using? That you have a very clear idea of, of how you're going to implement breeding, how you're going to implement markers, how you're going to implement all these technologies to develop that variety that you have to have to replace it, and how you're going to get that to the farmers. And I think that they're going to be looking for that, and they're going to be funding those concepts. Yeah, I, 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 I think, you know, so, so I, was at a, I was at a meeting um, at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation not too long ago, and, it, you know, and, and there, I think there is a, there is a lot of question of, of just in terms of seed production, in terms of what's being given to the farmers, is it really what they say it is? Um, and yeah, I, I, I think seed production is, is a huge, is a huge issue, right? Is, you know, once, once it leaves the breeding program, there's a lot of ways in which things can go wrong. You know, even with, you know, in a, in a clonal crop like cassava, you know, you can, you know, you can end up propagating the wrong thing. You can get virus infections that then get propagated and sent out. And so that, that production step is, is absolutely critical. It is out of scope for these projects. So these projects are, are, are really focused on the breeding aspect of things. I think there are other projects uh, like the, the big data uh, platform that I think are, are trying to focus a little bit more on the supply chain and how you can get a better handle on the supply chain and, and ensure that, that you have methods to kind of track material all the way through and make sure that uh, it's, it is what it is when it comes out the other end. Yeah. So if you just go for the foundation seed, but they are evaluated based on how many varieties they produce, the score should be very high. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah, it's, it's I, I, I think, and, and I, you know, I, I, I said it more from the funding model, but yeah, I think the way in which, you know, so people behave the way in which they're kind of incentivized to behave, you know, if, if you, if you, 
evaluate people you know, based off of you know, how well are you working together to deliver varieties that make it to the farmers versus how many publications you're getting as senior author, you're going to get very different behaviors out of people. It's, um, and so I, I think that's something on the CGIR side they have to think about is, you know, who are we? What are we trying to do? Are we a research organization where papers and translational research is our focus and germplasm is kind of secondary? We're leaving that to the national programs? Or are we uh, basically a, a breeding program that's delivering germplasm? And they're going to have to, I think, uh, have different sort of mechanisms for evaluating people depending on what that answer is. Kelly again for his great presentation. And, <laughs> and I think we're headed straight to the atrium now. The